Welcome back to the second day of uh, the 2023 Clarion course. Uh, our first session is uh, Katerina, who will tell us uh, about the latest technology about for uh, Clarion space integration. Hi everyone, thanks Josefe for organizing. Um, so yesterday, uh, Chris, uh, during his talk, told us that specimen preparation is the hardest part of uh, doing cryo um, So let's see if you guys agree about that. Um, we're gonna try to prepare a specimen. So what this entails is you take your very sharp tweezers, maybe you take a fancy jacket off. So, we take the tweezers, we take a grid, which we should have pre-cleaned. We clamp it in the tweezers. And we fix it into the plunger. where inside the chamber the humidity is controlled so that the tin film will not evaporate. We take a small volume of our sample. Apply to the foil side of the grid. And the liquid should spread nicely. Then we remove the excess liquid by blotting with the filter paper. That's it. So <laughs> it really wasn't that hard. Of course, um, in reality, in this container, you would have uh, liquid nitrogen and liquid ethane in the central pot where your grid would fall into. Uh, but that's it. It's quite a bit harder to do it in the MPLT. Uh, but overall, in a few seconds, you have your grid ready and off you go to the cryos. So well, um, in today's talk, I'm going to try to explain uh, what are the common pitfalls in the specimen preparation and what can you do to improve your specimens. All right. Okay, so the, really the problem is why can't we, with our biological specimens, uh, get images like this, which in material science was possible already more than 10 years ago, uh, where you can see a monolayer of graphene, you can see every individual atom in the lattice, and you can see even the defects in the lattice. Why is it that we will not be able to get images like this of molecules like that. And the answer is in the specimen. Uh, we are completely limited by the nature of the specimens that we want to look at because they're much more radiation sensitive than any of these inorganic materials that have been looked by TM. And uh, what happens to our um, biological specimens uh, in frozen water is that as soon as we turn on the electron beam, the specimen is completely destroyed. And definitely by the end of your uh, acqui acquiring one image of your specimen, uh, most of the bonds in the molecule are broken. Uh, that's why uh, we're trying to make the most out of every individual image that we acquire. Mm. And this graph summarizes our understanding of all the factors that uh, limit the quality of the images that we can acquire in CryM. Uh, the way we like to talk about quality is by using this number of B factor. Uh, so a, a very negative number is bad and a 
near zero is good. And uh, if we see how the quality of each image deteriorates during the exposure in the individual image, um, the main contributor, of course, is radiation damage. As I said, as you're acquiring your image, your specimen gets progressively more and more damaged. And uh, this is unavoidable. Uh, but what else uh, distorts our images? We have uh, motion of the specimen, uh, which quite unfortunately sometimes can distort the image at the very onset of irradiation, where the specimen is least damaged. And uh, we also have uh, charging of the specimen and charge fluctuations of the specimen. So now we're going to dissect these different factors and what can we do to uh, make things a little bit better. Uh, and the uh, first uh, part of the talk is about the motion of the specimen. So when we think about motion of the specimen in the cryo-EM, there is different types of motion which all will universally cause blurring of your image. Uh, of course, uh, the specimen is uh, inserted on the cryo stage of the microscope and uh, due to thermal gradients or mechanical vibrations, this, this whole stage with the specimen could move, which would blur your image. Uh, on top of that, Mm, the specimen, which is uh, this three millimeter grid uh, with a tin foil on it, uh, could uh, bend during electron radiation, uh, which we can see in these two little movies, um, where we're looking at the edge of one hole in the foil of the specimen and uh, how that moves during um, exposure to the electron beam. Um, I'm just going to play it again. And we can see that the, in the inset, the edge of the especially carbon foil moves much more than the edge of the gold foil. Uh, and that is during the stress, uh, due to the stress in these uh, frozen specimens. Uh, even on top of that, um, if we look at the suspended thin film of ice that we formed by blotting, we could see that this whole uh, film with the particles are protein embedded in it would bend during irradiation, that's extra motion that blurs the image even more. And on top of that, uh, due to the energy deposited by the electrons uh, into this layer uh, as they pass through it, uh, there will be some pseudo-Brownian motion which will uh, move around the water molecules but also the heavier proteins in, in the layer. And on top of that, we're not at zero temperature, so everything is vibrating, even though that's a, a small factor that shouldn't uh, bother us for the resolutions that we're working at. Um, and uh, we have been uh, working for a long time to try to address these problems of specimen <coughs> motion, mostly by developing different uh, types of grids. Um, and uh, the really big advance came with the work of uh, Chris and Laurie Passmore, uh, where I they realized that if the whole specimen supports the grid and the foil is made of metal, uh, gold, uh, that reduces uh, the amount of specimen motion. Uh, and then uh, uh, we did some further work to try to reduce the motion um, to the absolute theoretical limit, which is set by this uh, diffusion during the radiation. Um, so uh, the observation with the all metal gold supports uh, is that um, both in the presence and in the absence of the thin vitreous eye specimen uh, on the support, the amount of motion of the support itself, so this thin membrane with holes, uh, is reduced by a factor of around 50. Uh, and this is especially visible if you try to tilt the specimen because most of this motion is out of the plane of the support. Uh, but still, uh, the motion is not completely uh, zero. Um, and uh, that's what we look to address next. Uh, and to address that, we just uh, did a lot of these experiments where we were looking at some, how some fiducial markers move within the specimen. Uh, and first, we looked at the dependence of the motion of the specimen uh, as a function of the size of the hole in the support. Uh, and uh, we looked at that in non-tilted and tilted specimens. Uh, so again, one observation is the tilted specimens, the amount of motion you can see in the image is more. Another observation is that as you make the whole diameter smaller, the amount of motion decreases. Uh, the amount of motion is always uh, a big jump at the onset of irradiation and then somewhat levels off. And quite interestingly, um, as when you make the hole small enough, this dependence on the hole size is completely lost. 
And also now the amount of motion is the same in the non-tilted and in the tilted specimen. So the motion is isotropic. Uh, and then we were trying to understand mm, what is the reason that causes this movement uh, in order to be able to control it. And uh, this is a sort of a theory that we come up with, which really uh, is determined by how we prepare the specimens. So we started with our aqueous specimen, um, sometimes at 4C, sometimes at room temperature. Uh, at these conditions, the density of the water that mostly comprises our specimen is around 1. Uh, and then we really, we form this thin layer by blotting of, of away the excess liquid. Uh, and then we really quickly dropped it into the liquid E10. Uh, in the matter of around 0.1 milliseconds, the temperature of the specimen dropped from 4C to around 90 Kelvin. Uh, during this uh, very short time interval, uh, the density of the uh, water changed very abruptly. Uh, and after uh, the temperature crossed around 240 Kelvin, the glass transition point, you can think of uh, the layer already having become a solid. So at this temperature, uh, within the first part of this 0.1 millisecond, your specimen is already solidified, uh, but the density will keep changing very quickly. This causes a, a amount of stress to build up in this uh, suspended layer, because relative to this thin ice layer, the density of the gold does not change much. Uh, and if enough stress is built up in this thin layer, it will buckle, uh, like so, and then it will continue to cool and change density and further stress can be accumulated in this layer. And finally, you have it formed at around 90 Kelvin and then you put it in your storage, then it's stable for as long as, it, as, long as you leave it there. And that is, of course, because uh, at this low temperature, around 90 Kelvin, the diffusivity of the water is vanishingly small. So uh, it's really not going anywhere. But things change as soon as you put the specimen into the electron microscope and you turn the beam on. Uh, because every electron that will uh, impact the specimen will deposit some energy into the specimen. Uh, and you can think of that as an effective raise of the temperature, although it's not in thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, so what happens is you have put this uh, deformed specimen into the TM. And as soon as you turn the electron beam on, all the water molecules start moving around a little bit, and the diffusion constant measured by Greg uh, in the lab is uh, around one angstrom squared for every electron per angstrom squared of irradiation, which if you would like to think about it in terms of temperature, is as if you took this specimen and warmed it up uh, very briefly to 150 Kelvin. Uh, and at this point, of course, the density is a little bit different than what it was uh, at 90 Kelvin, and also uh, at around this point, the water starts to behave a little bit like liquid, um, and you have some unbalanced forces that will cause this uh, layer to further buckle. And this motion is what we see uh, in the blur of all of our images at the beginning of irradiation of the specimen. Um, so that is what we're trying to, to avoid with, uh, with the way that we prepare the specimens. Um, and how to avoid it? Well, it turns out that if you don't ever let the specimen buckle during the freezing, then it will be stable during the irradiation. And what determines the condition whether the specimen will deform or not deform during the freezing is pure geometrical constraints. So it depends on the aspect ratio of your layer uh, of ice thickness relative to the diameter of the holes in your support. And this is determined uh, by the fractional volume change of the, of the water. Um, so it turns out that the critical aspect ratio for the diameter to the thickness of the layer is around 11 to 1. So if the aspect ratio is more, the specimen will buckle during freezing and then will be unstable during irradiation. That will blur your image. If the aspect ratio is less than this 11 to 1, then the specimen will not buckle during the freezing and that will be stable during the irradiation. That will not move and the image will be, not be blurred. Uh, so let's look what do we normally do. Well, kind of normal for the single particle cryon would be to have a two micron hole and form something like a 200 angstrom thick ice. Well, the aspect ratio for this is 100 to 1. So clearly this is not a stable situation. Um, if we were to prepare a very thick um, layer, uh, like let's say uh, 200 nanometer uh, in the two micron hole, that aspect ratio is around 10. 
uh, that should be fine, that should not buckle. However, uh, this much thickness uh, is not great for trying to do transmission microscopy through it uh, because you start to get too much scattering through the sample. So ideally, we want to keep the thickness as thin as our proteins, so within a few hundred angstroms, uh, and that uh, necessitates making the holes really small. So uh, instead of using two micron holes in the supports, we would have to use 0.2 micron holes in the supports to keep these thin ice layers stable and prevent them from buckling. Um, so when we realized this, uh, we uh, started working on actually producing this type of specimen supports uh, and uh, ways to manufacture them because uh, it turns out that making these smaller holes is a little bit harder than making a large hole. Uh, but the grid that we use today to prepare our specimen is actually one of those. Um, and uh, this is just the side note that, yeah, we definitely don't want to fix the movement problem by just making a thicker specimen. And this is the graph you saw from Chris yesterday where you see the amount of information transmission through a specimen of 100 angstrom thickness, 300 angstrom thickness, and 1,000 angstrom thickness. And even if you are working at the most optimal voltage for each of these thicknesses, the amount of information you can get out of each of these specimens reduces with the increasing thickness. Um, and another, another way to think about this is uh, uh, shown on this uh, graph from Josh from Chris's lab, uh, where uh, the minimum protein mass that you could identify or align or solve in uh, ice layer of given thickness just increases with the thickness. And uh, note that the scale here is a log scale. So as soon as you uh, accept to make a specimen thicker, you accept that you will not be able to uh, solve a smaller target. Uh, so this is how this uh, specimen supports with the smaller holes look. Um, they were designed and manufactured at Dell and B and should soon be commercially available. Um, instead of having grid squares, you now have grid hexagons, but that's not really substantial. Each of these has uh, several thousand of these small holes. You would go and take an image of each of these little holes, which could still uh, contain a lot of your protein particles. Um, and the number of holes per grid is absolutely more than anything you would ever need for data collection, even with the modern detectors, even with the really high speeds that we can collect data at right now, like tens of thousands of images per day. Still, that would be just like a few areas of this grid. Um, and of course, because the holes are so small, it's easy to pack them in uh, close uh, and tight which means that within a single area accessible by image shift, you could collect hundreds of images without having to move the stage, which also ties in nicely with the modern ways of data collection, which Giuseppe will tell you about in his presentation. Um, another note is that as soon as you have decided to make the hole in the support smaller, it actually becomes easier to form a thin uniform ice layer uh, because uh, it is, um, Inevitably, your, you will, your layer will have some meniscus because of the surface tension of, uh, uh, of your specimen uh, in water. And uh, this curvature uh, will have less of an effect within the smaller hole. Uh, and uh, this especially uh, works well for specimens with detergents or other additives where it may be hard to form a nice uniformly thin layer in the large hole, but it's not the case in the in the small hole, and that's just one example, but we'll see more examples in a moment. And another thing we came to realize while we were working on making these specimen supports is that actually we don't really have to be limited by the types of grids that are commercially available. Uh, it is possible to design your own specimen support with your own um, design considerations for your particular application. You can literally sketch it and get to a manufactured grid within a few days of work, and it's not that hard, and you can incorporate whatever features are important for your project. So I think in the future, we'll see much more of these tailor-made specimen supports for the different applications. Um, and uh, this is just the example of the process, how we make the grids with the small holes. 
Um, but adaptations of this process have already been uh, started in the lab by others to try to make other custom supports. But there is a few techniques that you combine to, to do the different, uh, to do the different uh, parts of the grid. Uh, so usually all the fabrication is based on silicon wafers. So you're taking technologies that are well established in the semiconductor manufacturing. Um, you decide what patterns you want in the tin foil of the grid. Um, then you um, etch these patterns into the silicon wafer uh, using uh, plasmas. Uh, then you replicate these patterns in the metal by just depositing tin metal layers uh, on top of this uh, structured wafer, by usually by evaporation. Uh, and then on top of this tin pattern foil, you build up the grid bars, which is just the supporting structure that keeps the grid together. Um, and uh, this uh, thicker uh, piece of metal is usually deposited by electroplating, and uh, the shapes are all outlined by photolithography. Uh, so it's really not that hard, and this is a process that's very scalable and allows you to make hundreds and hundreds of these identical um, grids uh, in one go. So we're really looking forward to um, adapting this type of processes to make more uh, custom specimen supports. Um, final uh, point in the section about speci specimen movement is, of course, um, well, should we really worry about that if anyway later in the data processing stage we're going to try to account for this blurring of the images due to motion? Um, so we've done some tests uh, to, to uh, address this question. Should we worry about uh, movement if we're going to uh, take care of it in software? And um, the answer is it depends on the resolution. So if uh, you're not going to reach uh, much higher than four angstrom resolution, the quality of your data is going to be approximately the same, uh, whether your data is uh, already collected as motion-free data or your data has been later motion corrected in software. Uh, but then uh, things start to diverge at higher resolutions where the motion-free data is always a little bit better than our best attempt to account for uh, motion in software. Um, so it, it always depends. But universally, uh, by physically eliminating the motion in your specimens, by preparing them on the appropriate type of supports, you can make all your data better, regardless of the specimen. Um, another side note about motion is the influence of the uh, addition of cryoprotectants to the specimen. Um, uh, of course, it may be appealing to add cryoprotectants for a few reasons. Uh, sometimes it's just for the stability of the protein itself. But uh, another uh, logic would be to try to eliminate any volume change upon freezing and then uh, try to prevent this uh, accumulation of stress during freezing in the specimen. Um, so if we look at the volume changes of some water cryoprotectant mixtures that are known from the literature, uh, we can see that, for example, uh, for ethylene glycol, the red curve, um, if uh, we were to add approximately 20%, uh, we should uh, reach this neutral point where the density is the same at room temperature and at temperature of liquid nitrogen. Um, so let's see what happens as soon as we start adding cryoprotectant to the specimen. If we add a small amount, uh, the specimen behaves kind of similar to the specimen without cryoprotectant, so that's as expected. You start irradiating it, the specimen is still uh, under compression during the freezing and still it buckles in the same way and all the fiducial markers move outwards. If you add, a if you add this uh, predicted amount, actually what turns out is that you flip the sign of the delta V over V, so you overshot a little bit. And now the specimen is not under compression, but under tension. And as soon as you start irradiating it, all the particles start moving inwards towards the center of the holes. Uh, and then you could add some intermediate amounts of cryoprotectant, thinking that, okay, maybe this curve goes more like that. Uh, but still, it's very hard to make a mixture that has a neutral volume change upon freezing. And that is probably because it not only matters what's the density of the specimen at the starting and the final temperature, but also throughout all these temperatures during the cooling. And that's not really known. Um, but nevertheless, if you're not adding the cryoprotectant for a uh, reason of reducing motion, but because, uh, because of your specimen, 
uh, some people have shown, uh, like work from Gabe Landry's group, is that you can still do cryam in the presence of high concentration of cryoprotectant, like as much as 20% glycerol in the specimen if you need to. And the quality of the data is a little bit worse, and, um, but not, not completely impossible. And uh, of course, uh, the, this difference in quality is partially due to the increased density of the solvent, water versus water plus glycerol, and also partially due to the presence of this cryoprotect and making it a little bit harder to form a very thin uh, uniformized layer. All right, so this brings us to the second part of uh, the talk about the specimen preparation. And this is about all the surfaces that your specimen will interact with during the preparation. Uh, so one very simple observation is that all the proteins like to adhere to different surfaces. And now we will see this uh, tomogram of uh, ribosomes uh, from TAMEI, uh, where we will see, we're seeing this ice contamination on the top of the thin water layer. And we'll see that most of the ribosomes will either come immediately below the uh, water layer or at the, very, at the very end of the tomogram near the support film. So here we see there is a few ribosomes, and now the majority is at the lowest section attached to the carbon support film. So virtually none of the protein remained in the solution. All of it went and got stuck either to the supporting surface or to the air-water interface surface. And this is a problem that's been known for a long time and discussed in many papers and especially many reviews by Bob Glazer that you can look at. Um, this is universal, doesn't happen just for ribosomes, pretty much for any specimen you look at, uh, and does not seem to really depend on dye thickness. So, for example, uh, these are just slices of tomograms taken from various single particle specimens uh, at the NYSBC by Alex Noble and their colleagues. And if you look at, let's see, this DNA helicase loader, all the particles are at the water meniscus. The ice layer is quite thick, more than 100 nanometer, really thicker than you would like it to be. And still there is no protein in, in the middle of the, of the ice layer. All of these particles went and interacted with the interface and got stuck to it. And the same, same thing for virtually any of these other specimens. Uh, another, another good example is this one, where all the particles are distributed at the two interfaces and uh, nothing remains in solution. Um, and this, uh, uh, if you try to calculate about the diffusion of the protein during this time that it took me between uh, blotting off the excess liquid and plunging the specimen to the liquid ethane, this all makes sense uh, because, uh, the, because even for the smallest, uh, even for the biggest proteins with the smallest uh, diffusion constants, uh, uh, even with some very quick time like a second, uh, there is enough time for them to go to the interface of the thin layer uh, tens of times. Uh, and even if we were doing uh, the specimen freezing by some mm, faster method, let's say on a millisecond time scale, there would still be enough time for all the proteins to go and interact with the interfaces multiple times. Uh, it is very easy to spot uh, whether this happens to your particular specimen. In a micrograph, you don't even need to take a tomogram. And that is because in your micrograph, you will see more of your protein uh, than uh, would correspond to the concentration that you applied your specimen at. And that should already be a warning sign for you that your specimen definitely interacts with their water interface. Uh, and uh, for example, you can refer to this uh, table uh, from uh, this review from uh, Vinod and Richard, uh, where some of these uh, numbers are calculated for various cases. And uh, I urge you to try and calculate this for your uh, favorite specimens as well. Almost invariably, you will be seeing more particles than you expect to see. And that's because they're stuck to their water interface. Um, Already Jacques Dubouchet in 1985 with the very first cryo-EM uh, micrographs noticed that the air-water interface uh, not only can attract the proteins, but can also disrupt their structure. Uh, so for example, these um, virus capsids are relatively intact in the thicker part of the specimen, 
And then here you just see the fragments of the broken capsids and the nucleic acids that came uh, out of the broken capsids. Um, in, even if you do your best to analyze your specimen, by, which you should do before you start doing cryom, by any biophysical technique, and it looks absolutely pure and homogeneous, it is perfectly enzymatically active, even maybe you've done negative stain and it looks great, it is still possible that you will prepare a cryom grid and the specimen will have somewhat fallen apart. That's because it has interacted with their water interface. Um, so, for example, in this uh, fatty acid synthase example from uh, Eduardo Dimprima's work in Werner Kuban's group, you can see that in 90% of the particles that he picked from his cryo-electron micrographs, actually part of the protein structure is disrupted. And that's due to interaction with their water interface. And of course, 90% is a really big fraction of your data. It means you need to collect 10 times more particles to actually get the number of non-broken protein. Uh, and the denaturation of protein on the surfaces of air-water interfaces has been well known for, uh, in other fields. Uh, for example, you could uh, form a thin layer of protein on the surface of a bath of buffer and measure the X-ray reflectance of this thin layer. Uh, and by this, you can, can notice that, for example, for lysozyme, the amount of denaturation on the surface of a buffer is approximately similar to as if you added four molar urea to the set specimen. So that's a really harsh condition that your specimen meets at this air-water interface. And then uh, below this layer of denatured protein that immediately goes and gets stuck to the interface, there will be a layer of intact particles uh, that you can actually image by TEM. Uh, and also you can see that if you add another surfactant that will go and occupy this layer, like in this example it's oleic acid, you can prevent the protein from denaturing and going to, to their water interface. Um, so that's a common trick uh, that we sometimes uh, play to address this problem. And of course another problem that comes from the uh, presence of air water interfaces is the fact that as soon as the protein went and interacted with that interface, it may be preferentially oriented. And that's not something we want because we would like the proteins in the cryom images to show us all of their different orientations, which is necessary for us to be able to reconstruct the 3D structure of the protein. Um, yeah, so as I said, the preventing this is quite difficult and there are a few approaches to try to do that. Uh, one approach is to try to occupy the uh, air-water interface with something else that is not your protein. And uh, one common choice is to add a small amount of detergent to your specimen. Um, this is a bit of a... Um, depends on which specimen you're working uh, with and the different people like to do different things. There is probably one systematic uh, uh, analysis of the different detergents and that's this paper by Lee et al. And uh, they find something quite interesting. So uh, if you add a non-ionic or a zwitterionic detergent, uh, that actually will go to their water interface, uh, occupy it, and then it will prevent proteins from sticking to the interface at all. Uh, now the disadvantage is that maybe you will not be able to form this very thin layer of protein. If you add an anionic detergent, which are not very common, but still you can try to do that, uh, seems like uh, nothing changes. The protein will still go and stick to their water interface. And even further, it will still stick in the same orientation that it likes to stick to the pure air water interface. And quite interestingly, if you add a detergent with the opposite charge, so a cationic detergent, the protein will still like and go to stick to the interface, but it will uh, display a different preferential orientation. Uh, so you have these different options to try and all of this will be sample dependent, but if this is an issue for your sample, you can either try to add the non-ionic detergents to keep your sample away from their water interface, or possibly a small amount of a cationic detergent to try to at least get your sample to orient in a different way. Another option is if you don't want to add any additives to your sample is to modify your specimen support somehow. Uh, a common modification is to add a support, thin supporting layer over which the thin film will be formed. So now instead of the air-water interface, you have an interface between your buffer and the support. Uh, it's best to uh, try to make the supporting layer as thin as possible. And of course, the thinnest you can come up with is just a monolayer of graphene. Um, 
and um, the graph needs to be made hydrophilic for the solution to spread nicely on it. Uh, and this can be achieved by a variety of ways, for example, hydrogen plasmas. Uh, but still, you can see that if you apply the same amount of protein to variously treated graphene layers, the amount of particles you see in the different image is actually keeps increasing, although the concentration did not change, which again indicates that the specimen interacts with that interface as well. Okay, it's not the air-water interface anymore, it's the graphene-water interface, but there is still an interaction which may still be detrimental to some proteins. Uh, another reason why supporting layers are interesting is because they allow you to try to um, do some chemistry on top of them. Uh, and there is a myriad of ways to, to achieve that on the, for example, on graphene surfaces. Broadly, uh, two types of approaches, uh, using uh, plasmas to activate uh, some reactions which would be otherwise a little bit improbable. You can attach various functional groups to these supporting layers. Uh, and alternatively, using uh, various uh, chemical or photochemical approaches. And even if the supporting layer is not the universal solution for the interface problem. Uh, this may be still interesting for, for example, attaching uh, tags to grids and trying to uh, keep, to trying to get proteins to stick to the grids in this way. Um, of course, for any of this to work, it's essential to start with a clean layer of graphene, like in this schematic. And the reality is that that's uh, rarely possible, which actually makes all of these approaches very difficult and uh, very um, somewhat irreproducible. Uh, but still, we're, uh, we're looking forward to more developments in, in this area. Um, if you look at the orientation of your specimen on different surfaces, um, you will see that the different surfaces can affect that orientation. Here, the orientation distributions of the same specimen on different types of functionalized graphene. Uh, and every time, the specimen did adopt some preferred orientations, but depending on the surface, they were different. <coughs> uh, another way to think about these maps of orientations is uh, as a map of the interaction strength of your protein with that surface. So if you have one very preferred orientation, uh, that means that the specimen really strongly interacts with that surface, uh, with that side of the, pro of the specimen. Uh, and interaction is inevitable just with any surface. We have never been able to get absolutely uniform orientation distribution, which would indicate no interaction with the surface. Uh, it is not trivial to see uh, which of these orientation distributions is uh, the best for uh, three-dimensional reconstruction, uh, but there are computer programs that can help you figure that out. Um, if we recall this table from a few slides back that told us that regardless of how fast we prepare the specimen, there is enough time for the proteins to go to the interfaces, um, we could think, uh, is it, does it make sense to try to maybe outrun it, uh, outrun this effect and prepare the specimens quicker uh, to, to reduce at least the amount of interaction with the interfaces? Um, a lot of people who work on time-resolved cryo-EM have uh, these devices that uh, can prepare a specimen within milliseconds from application of the sample to the grid. Uh, and they have looked at the orientation distributions of the various specimens as a function of the time between application of the thin layer to the grid and freezing. And you can see that the, for a fixed specimen, the orientation distribution can change depending on how much time elapsed between the specimen application. But even in the shortest times that are accessible to, to our current technology, uh, there has already been enough time for interactions to happen and the proteins to adopt some kind of preferred orientation. Um, still, these uh, fast plunger devices are great for time-resolved cryo-EM. Uh, there is many, many ways uh, to try to do that, but only a few brave people in the LMV uh, uh, do this approach. Uh, of course, this uh, was pioneered by Nigel at the LMV with a, a plunger where you can first apply your specimen number one, blot the excess away, then drop the grid into liquid it, and, and as it's falling past, uh, you could spray small droplets of your second component that you want your specimen to interact with. Um, 
Another approach is to spray both components that you want to mix onto a grid that's uh, falling towards the cryogen. Uh, that may be a bit problematic uh, because the, there is not much time for the thin layer of liquid to form. Uh, this can be improved by the use of special self-wicking grids, where instead of removing the excess liquid with the paper, as we did here, the excess liquid is just drained onto the grid bars of the grid, which are coated with these nanowires. Uh, and another way to, uh, to, to get some time resolution is to actually mix your components in a microfluidic chip uh, with a controlled time delay and then spray them into a grid that is falling into liquid ATN. But universally, all of these approaches are still very difficult. And they are very difficult because the ice layers that you form are kind of thick for our standards. The area that actually is usable for data collection is not that much. Um, the apparent concentration of proteins in these micrographs is quite low because there was not that much interaction with their water interface. Uh, it is hard to control the delay times and for most biological processes even these millisecond delay times are a bit too long. And at the same time within these short delay times it is hard to achieve good mixing of different components. So uh, definitely the area of time-resolved cryon will still see a lot of improvements. Uh, there are some emerging methods for uh, time-resolved cryon that we are very excited about. For example, this idea from Ulrich Lorenz at the EPFL, where you would prepare your frozen sample just as normally, just as we prepared now. Then you would apply a very brief but very strong laser pulse to briefly unfreeze the sample then apply some stimulus to allow some process or interaction to happen between the different <coughs> components in the sample. And then the sample would rapidly refreeze by virtue of the rest of the specimen support being called. Uh, so this approach promises a microsecond rather than millisecond time resolution, which would be great, but still a lot of work is also uh, going to be required to to actually make this uh, a common approach. And especially, it is hard to um, implement it. It is hard to control the temperature to which you heat the specimen during the melting. And it is actually hard to come up with applying a stimulus because for a lot of these ideas, you maybe need caged ligands. OK, finally, uh, we just have a very short section about uh, charging, uh, which is um, one of the reasons that can contribute to the blurring of your images. So we're going to watch a movie from Chris and Richard, uh, which shows you a holy uh, support, uh, holy foil of a specimen support. And it's taken at a very, very low <coughs> electron exposure, so you can barely see the holes. Now a very bright beam will appear on the middle uh, here. And then uh, we'll be switched off, and we will continue recording this large area at a low electron irradiation. And then I'll just play this again from the start. Okay, so let's see what actually happened in this movie. So we had our foil with holes. Um, then we irradiated this little area with a very bright beam. And now we see that the apparent contrast of the adjacent holes changed, but also this area that was irradiated now looks darker. And then we continue taking images with a very low irradiation, and we see that this effect will somewhat dissipate until after a lot of exposure, uh, the final image will look kind of similar to the initial image. So let's see what happened during this time. Well, one thing you need to recall is that charges can act as electron lenses. So of course the foil did not change color. It is just that the part of the foil that was irradiated got charged up and that's what changes the appearance of the contrast in the images. So we think this is what happens. You start with a holy film. You turn on your very bright electron beam and you irradiate a small area. When you're irradiating this area, uh, a lot of secondary electrons leave this area and will land on some adjacent areas. What you're left with then is some positive charges in the area that you irradiated and some negative charges landed on the adjacent areas, especially they like to land on some contaminants. Uh, and then you can keep irradiating this whole uh, se segment with a slightly less bright beam 
uh, and that will allow charges to move around further. Some of these negative charges will come back to neutralize uh, the positive charges of the initially exposed area. And eventually, if you radiate long enough, you will be able to be left with a almost a uniform charge distribution as you started with. Uh, and any area that was uh, positively charged will lens the electrons. Uh, and any area that was negatively charged will also lens the electrons just with the, with the opposite sign. Uh, and that will distort your images. And of course, uh, this happens uh, at the beginning of every image that you start taking of your specimen in a hole in an ice layer on a supporting foil. Uh, luckily, the primary charge, uh, which is positive in your irradiation area, builds up very quickly. So within less than 1,000 of an electron per angstrom squared. So you will never actually see it in your data. And then the negative charge in the adjacent area will build up a little bit more slowly. Um, still, this can distort your image. And this can especially be made worse if you are not irradiating any conductive piece, like the foil surrounding the hole, uh, because then the charge compensation will be reduced. Um, so this is definitely a problem, for example, for specimens which don't have any uh, metal layers, like uh, lamella. Uh, and it has been shown that for a lamella, uh, empirically, having a thin coating of a platinum sputter layer on top of the lamella makes your data a little bit better, because probably it reduces the amount of charge buildup on the lamella, although the cost you pay for that is that you're actually imaging everything through that thin metal layer, so you're, you're losing uh, some, some contrast. Uh, and there is definitely a need for understanding the charging better, and also coming up with strategies how to mitigate its effect in the absence of metal supporting layers, which we do have in single particle cryo. Uh, so there is definitely many questions to still be worked out, like how is the charge distributed in the irradiated area? How does this depend on the thickness of the specimen? Um, how does the charge dissipate at different uh, imaging temperatures? And definitely more ideas are needed for some good ways to support a thin lamella without a mm, continuous layer on it. Um, in addition to this charge buildup that happens during the beginning of every exposure, you also have charge fluctuations throughout every exposure, which are just the random local increases or decreases uh, in the amount of charge. And uh, you can see that these uh, are always a little bit more in the uh, ice. So not on the supporting pole, but actually on your specimen. But again, this, is, this effect is quite small, so it's not a major, major uh, cause for uh, quality reduction of our data. Um, so if I have to sum it up, uh, what we can do to universally improve all of our specimens in terms of how much they move and how much they charge up during irradiation is to just uh, switch to using all metal supports if possible. Uh, and uh, you will notice that all of these ultra high resolution aperitin structures were all done with all gold grids. Um, and that's really the only piece of advice that works for every single specimen. Uh, beyond that, the, how to address the interaction of specimen with air-water interface will depend a lot on your particular case. Um, finally, uh, one note about a completely different way of preparing samples for cryem, which is not plunge freezing, uh, but high pressure freezing. So what we achieved by plunge freezing was we started from liquid water at around 300 Kelvin, and we very quickly went to 80 Kelvin, uh, into this uh, phase uh, that's called low density amorphous ice. And the uh, only reason why we didn't get stuck in some crystalline ice phase is because we plunged very quickly. Um, however, there is another way to avoid uh, landing into the crystalline water phase and go to uh, amorphous phase, and that's by high pressure freezing. So you would apply something like uh, more than 200 megapascal of pressure uh, within uh, a few milliseconds of time and drop the temperature at the same time. And that will allow you to access this phase of water, which is called high density amorphous ice. Um, so this is a slightly different uh, type of vitreous water. It's still not a crystal, but it's different from the ice that we prepare by plunge freezing. 
And still, this is a very common way to prepare samples for the in-situ cryam. And we know depressingly little about this phase of uh, water because it is quite unstable. Uh, but there is some good evidence that if you take this high-density amorphous water uh, and you put it in the TM and you irradiate it with a small flux, like four electrons per angstrom squared, basically this is just the beginning of your micrograph, the phase of the water will change, as shown by this uh, amorphous diffraction pattern, from high density to low density ice. So as soon as you turn your electron beam on, onto this high density specimen, you go from the high density phase via the liquid phase into the low density phase. Inevitably, this means that all of the specimens uh, prepared by high pressure freezing uh, have some amount of rearrangement occurring in them during the onset of every image, which may be contributing to uh, some of the loss of uh, quality uh, of the images. But still, we need to do a lot more experiments to understand this uh, better. And um, it's not even clear whether the high, pressure, the high pressure frozen ice is always high density. Um, we don't really know how this is affected by additives, such as like huge concentrations of protein, which we usually have in these types of specimens. And we don't really know whether the phase already relaxes to the low density phase during prior processing, like fluid milling, or whether it happens during electron irradiation. Uh, but definitely this is something to, to keep in mind. And Vicky will talk more about uh, how to prepare the samples for the in-situ tomography and the high pressure freezing. All right, um, so with that, I'm just going to leave uh, this up, which is uh, my wish list of things that we will be, uh, we will have done by the next uh, CRIAM LMB course uh, on the front of uh, specimen preparation. Um, especially, I'm looking forward to some specimen preparation methods for uh, thicker specimens. Um, and for more cryam access to be able to very quickly uh, check the quality of different specimens that are prepared. Thank you.